to the Fit and Fabulous podcast with Dr. Jamie Seaman. Everybody, it's Dr. Jamie, and welcome back to the Fit and Fabulous podcast. Thanks for everybody that's listened to our previous episodes, downloaded the episodes, left us our reviews, all the YouTube watchers. You guys have no idea how much you help us when you share these with people in your world that you think might find this information interesting and help spread the word about the topics that we talk about. Well, I want to introduce you to today's guest on the Fit and Fabulous podcast, the one and only Dr. Paul Saladino. Uh, I know some of you have heard me on his podcast, and we've uh, recorded a YouTube and chatted about pregnancy and the importance of nutrient-dense animal diets, and um, I've even had some patients come find me because of Dr. Saladino. So, uh, Paul, thanks for everything you're doing in the world. Thanks for having me. It's good to be here. So for those of you that don't know him, or uh, maybe you're a vegan or vegetarian, I feel like I feel like a lot of those people still know Paul too, <laughs> but he's one of the leading authorities, you guys, on the carnivore diet, and he used it to reverse his own autoimmune conditions, chronic inflammation, and mental health issues, and I'm going to let you... I'm going to let you tell about your background, Paul, because I think it's very unique. Even though you're a doctor, I think it's unique in this space. So tell us who the hell Paul Saladino is, please. So I, uh, yeah, who the heck am I? I went, to William <laughs> Mary, went to William Mary for college, studied chemistry and biology, did all the things, and then got really burned out and took six years off. So this isn't something that you highlight on your resume traditionally, but I really feel like those six years, I think spending six years as a ski bomb, through hiking the Pacific Crest Trail, New Zealand getting caught in avalanches, swimming flooded rivers and backpacking by myself. Like it just changes the way you see the world. And then when I went back to medicine after six years, I went to PA school at George Washington and quickly became disillusioned with the way that I saw the medical, the medical world, the medical paradigm, it's symptom focused, pharmaceutical base. And I thought I can't be a part of this. I was working in cardiology and I wanted to go back. So I went back to medical school. I did it twice. I uh, had to do medical school, school twice to figure it all out. And then I went to the University of Arizona and then University of Washington for residency. And throughout all of it, I had the intention of doing some kind of root cause based medicine. I was just like, I'm not going to work in medicine if it's not interesting to me, if I can't actually affect health at a foundational fundamental level. I have a podcast called Fundamental Health. And that's why I, it's where that name came from. And like, I want people to achieve like their birthright. I really feel like humans have a birthright to radical health. And we're not told that by medicine. We're told it's okay that you have rheumatoid arthritis. It's okay you have diabetes. It's okay you have heart disease. Um, this is your bad genetics. There's nothing you could have done. Here's a medication. Aren't you thankful for um, the pharmaceutical gods in the, in the heavens, in the pantheon of pharmaceuticals? And that just really nauseated me. And I thought that's BS. There's something else going on. I want to understand what causes atherosclerosis working in cardiology. And then more broadly, as I go back to medical school, I want to understand what causes everything. If I can, I think it's all connected. And I think that you know, there is an Occam's razor of paradigm in medicine that, that it, there's probably not 7,500,000 uh, diseases in, in Western medicine. There's probably like seven. And, and they just manifest different ways in different people. There's not like lupus and Sjogren's and autoimmune thyroiditis. It's all kind of the same illness, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, and all these, you know, really, really specific esoteric diseases. It's all kind of the same thing in my mind. So I think that it's more, um, there's more commonality between the illnesses that hurt humans than, than we're being taught. And so I, I really wanted to think about this differently. So I think that those six years of traveling and just really being a, 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 an, an adventurer, for lack of a better word, I hope that's not too cheesy. It just shaped my perspective. It made me a bit of an iconoclast. And I've always been this, this incorrigible medical student resident. I almost got kicked out of medical school. I almost got kicked out of residency. I just ask a lot of questions and I piss people off and I'm just out of the box. And it wasn't because I was doing anything that would harm patients. It's just that I think that I just, I think about things differently and residents and, and physicians don't always appreciate that. So thankfully I made it through all of those places and I did well. I'm not it's got great scores on my boards and all this kind of stuff. And so then at the end of my residency, I was sort of realizing, you know, hey, I still have eczema. I'm thinking about diet. And ultimately what I describe for myself is that I just, my diet is, is a key arbiter for me. I'm, and I'm living in Seattle. So that's probably not ideal in terms of circadian rhythms or light, but I was, I was eating a pretty good diet, like an organic paleo diet. And I was still having bad eczema. What is going on here? And so that really led me to think about the work from people like Bruce Ames and others that have characterized plants and really done botanical scientific analyses and said, hey, plants have pesticides that are built into the plants. Plants have defense chemicals. Okay, well, maybe I'll just cut out all the plants from my diet, eat meat and organs, do this carnivore diet. And I got really interested because I felt good in the beginning. My eczema went away. Psychologically, I felt better. 
And it was great. <laughs> and then long term, you know, the story is that I got super interested in the carnivore diet. It leads me down all kinds of rabbit holes. You learn about all these fallacies in Western medicine. You reevaluate the notion of LDL. We can talk about all of this today and fiber and gut microbial diversity. It challenges so many different paradigms in medicine when you eat only meat. And then, you know, along the road, I realized after a, a year and a half that long term ketosis wasn't going to be ideal for me. I had heart palpitations and muscle cramps and um, sleep disturbances a little bit from long term keto. And so I had to kind of go back and look at the work that I'd done and say, are carbohydrates really that bad? I'd, I'd avoided fruit because of this fructose issue. And I thought, oh, fruit, fructose is clearly bad for humans. There's so many studies that show it's bad. But when I really dug into that more, what I found out was that, oh, the studies that show fructose are bad are these sort of uh, nutritional reductionism studies where they're using pure fructose or pure glucose or pure sucrose, and not really looking at food in the whole foods matrix. So what is the literature surrounding fruit and humans or honey and humans? And you find a whole different body of literature. That kind of leads me to where I've landed long-term, which I would call carnivore-ish or animal-based. And that's like, basically what I eat now is meat, organs, fruit, and honey. And I'm seeking the most sought after foods evolutionarily. I went to visit the Hadza this year, spent time with them. They're some of the last remaining hunter gatherers on the planet. And you find that like, this is where a lot of humans end up, right? They, they hunt and they gather, but they don't just gather leaves that are bitter and kind of give them stomach aches or diarrhea. They generally gather honey and fruit when they can. And if they're absolutely starving and they don't have a healthy animal they can kill, they don't have any fruit and they don't have any honey, then they might go eat things like plant leaves or plant seeds. And they might think really hard about how to detoxify them. So I've kind of gone through that whole spectrum, but it's been a fascinating journey, ultimately asking the question, what is the most evolutionarily appropriate diet for humans? And how do we really reclaim this birthright to radical health that I think is, is all of ours? Okay, so how how are we getting this so wrong? Because I, you know, went through training just like you, and you kind of get indoctrinated into this like evidence based medicine, evidence based medicine, and people who went down functional integrative paths, which I have now gone down, it was like they're so marginalized. These people are quacks. You know, this is like what you hear during your training, and when we talk about LDL and when we talk about the root cause of a lot of these things, I feel like, like margarine and butter, like, I feel like, how did we get it so wrong for the last 30 years? Like why in 2021 are people being promoted a plant-based diet? Good question. I think it's because it's nuanced and it's complex. And if you don't think about things, I think as humans, we have a handicap. And when you look at a complex issue, you have to kind of go in with a bias and you have to kind of create some mental framework the, with, for you to look at that complex problem. And this is a handicap that we have. And I think that the best thinkers, you know, Einstein and people who really thought outside the box were probably able to discard that handicap more than I can, right? But even me, like when I'm looking at something, I have a handicap. And I have a framework, a lens through which I'm looking at something. And I think that Western medicine has a handicap and it's a really bad handicap. And they're looking at nutritional studies from a, from a lens that's wrong. And their lens is, you know, LDL causes heart disease or their, their lens is they're just, they're looking at things incorrectly, or I should, maybe it's the reverse. Maybe it's the fact that I look at things through a different lens. The lens that I look at things at is like, what's my intuition based on our evolutionary past as humans? Homo habilis, Homo erectus, Homo sapiens, where have we come from? The anthropology, the union of anthropology, being with the Hadza, learning about what hunter gatherers do has made all the difference for me because it gives you a different lens. And then you can look at the literature and think, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Is there literature that contradicts this piece of literature? And you find that there is, and you think, oh, okay, this is our problem, right? We have this sort of confirmation bias. We look for a small amount of literature that confirms our bias. And then we think, look, there's plenty of literature here to support this. And so that's the problem with Western medicine is Western medicine doesn't look at things through an evolutionary lens. It doesn't look at things through an hunter-gatherer lens, an anthropology lens, what makes sense for us evolutionarily. For instance, LDL is a good example. Western medicine just looks at the science and it has no anchor, right? So that may not be a bad thing, except that if you're not considering all the science or you're not, or you're leaving out important science, 
then you're, you're lost. You're lost at sea. So Western science looks at LDL literature and it says, look at there's lots of epidemiology, which are observational studies like the Framingham data, which show that if you have a higher LDL, that you have a higher incidence of cardiovascular disease. And then they look at other studies like statin interventional trials and say, hey, if you take a statin and you inhibit HMG-CoA reductase and you lower the production of cholesterol, which is a, um, you know, a precursor for the contents of the LDL lipoprotein particle in the human body, then you have a lower incidence of heart disease in people who have already had heart attacks. Therefore, it's very clear that LDL is a bad actor because if we lower it with a statin, um, you get increased cardiac, you get better cardiac outcomes. And if you lower it, you know, and people who have hypercholesterolemia, familial hypercholesterolemia tend to have worse cardiovascular outcomes. And if you look at epidemiology, the people that have more LDL have more cardiovascular disease case closed. This is hook line. This is just, there's a nail. It's clearly done. But when you look at this evolutionarily, I think, wait a minute. <laughs> LDL is a molecule that does so many things in the body besides killing us. It doesn't even kill us in the first place, but Western medicine believes that it kills us. It's an immune particle. It actually binds onto things like LPS, you know, uh, lipopolysaccharide, endotoxin in the human body. And this has been shown that like HDL, LDL, chylomicrons, VLDL, all these lipoproteins have immune roles in the human body. And you can look at animal studies and when they infuse LDL, when they give more lipoproteins to animals, these animals survive pathogen infections more. So people with like the equivalent is like, well, does that mean that humans who have more LDL might be protected from pathogen infections? Possibly. It certainly works that way in animals. And we know that in humans, the LDL also does this. It, it really um, neutralizes endotoxin in the human body. But we've never been told that LDL is an immune particle or that HDL, VLDL. So then you start to think, okay, these are immune particles that serve invaluable roles in the human body. Do I really believe evolutionarily that we would have evolved something that's essential for human life and also killing us. You know, there are, there are these um, genetic conditions where you don't make enough cholesterol, smith lenly oppitz syndrome. And those kids are born with mental retardation and developmental delay and all these problems. And they have no LDL recurrent infections. And the way that we treat them is with egg yolks. We give them literally pitchers and pitchers of cholesterol in egg yolks, and they get better. We know that if you don't make LDL because you have a defect in cholesterol synthesis, you don't function as a human. This is a critical molecule for human evolution. Yet we're telling it, we're being told it's bad for us. So that doesn't make a whole lot of sense if you look at it through an evolutionary lens. But Western yeah. medicine doesn't do that. It just wants to take three or four studies or 30 or 40 studies and then call the case closed. But when you start looking for studies that poke holes in this, you find them. You find studies, if you re-examine that Framingham data, and I actually have the graphic I can show you if you want. Um, if you stratify that Framingham data by HDL, which is a proxy for metabolic health, you see a completely different relationship between LDL and cardiovascular disease emerge where by people that are metabolically healthy, that is people with HDLs of 65 or 85 milligrams per deciliter have a completely different relationship in their LDL to cardiovascular disease curve. It's essentially a flat line, meaning if you have an HDL of 65 or 85, which is a proxy for you being metabolically healthy, something you've probably talked about in your podcast, oh, I'm not getting too technical, you know, low fasting insulin, whatever, you, there's really no good evidence in the literature that rising LDL is in any way, shape, or form related to increased incidence of heart disease at all. But Western medicine didn't think about that and ignores that fact because they're not thinking about things through an evolutionary lens. Then you can look at the literature with LDL as an immune particle. Then you can look at other epidemiology like the Copenhagen study and say, if we do a, if we do a subgroup analysis in Copenhagen and we look at men who have high HDL and low triglycerides, oh, wait a minute, <laughs> then their, their LDL doesn't really correlate with ischemic heart disease. They have very low rates of ischemic heart disease. What's going on here? Well, it's all about context, right? Why would a particle that is essential for human life that rises when you eat animal meat and organs, probably the saturated fat, raises LDL, but you get more metabolically healthy, presumably if you're cutting out other things and your HDL goes up, your triglycerides go down. Why would that be bad for us? It doesn't make any sense. Why would a particle that is essential for human life that moves around precursors for hormones to humans be directly injurious to the uh, endothelial wall. There was a guest on Joe Rogan the other day who said, L he described LDL as an atherogenic particle. And I wanted to reach through my freaking car and just slap him. And I wouldn't do that. You know, obviously I'm not physically violent person, whatever. But like metaphorically, I just wanted to slap Peter Atia and be like, no, you're wrong. Like you cannot convince me. I think you're wrong um, that LDL is atherogenic. And so this is the idea here. And I hope I didn't get too far down the rabbit hole, but if you look at things through an evolutionary lens, which we don't do in medical school, a lot of these things make a lot of sense. You're like, wait a minute, would we have done this as humans for millions of years? Yes. Would we have eaten meat? Yes. Would we have eaten organs? Yes. Would we have eaten saturated fat? Absolutely. 
What do we have eaten? Honey, yes. Would we have eaten fruit? Yes. Would we have eaten occasional tubers? Sure. Would we have played in the dirt? Yep. Would we have gotten lots of sun? Yep. Uh, but sun causes cancer, right? Well, maybe we should think more about that. Maybe it's the sunscreen, which is recently found to have many chemicals which contribute to cancer, solid organ tumors. Maybe there's something else going on here. What do we have eaten? Seed oils. Mm, don't think so. <laughs> what do we have eaten? Sugar as fructose or sucrose. Mm, don't think so. Would we have consumed uh, hot, lots of things like cigarettes? Nope, we wouldn't have done that. So this really, it's, it's my bias, but it's the lens through which I see the world um, and, and medical science, and that has made all the difference. And so and this is a long way to answer to your question. So I think we've gone very wrong in medicine because it's complex, because there are literally thousands of studies and what human brain can parse all those out. So we take shortcuts. And the shortcuts we take handicap us. We must have a bias. We must have a lens or a framework through which to see these things. And in many cases, that framework is wrong. And if we have the right framework, or I think a more useful framework, maybe I'm wrong, but my hypothesis is a much more useful framework is an evolutionary model. We start to ask better questions and you find fascinating rabbit holes of research to go down. Yeah, I think, and I think 2020 really highlighted this is like, people are like, it's the science, it's the science, it's the science. Nothing is ever permanent. I mean, look at like what we thought about x-rays and what we thought about smoking and what, I mean, we learn with time and I just think it's so much more of an art than a science. And I hate when people just think it's like completely black and white, like this is the evidence. I think if you picked something like LDL, like you can always find 10 studies on this side and 10 studies on this side. Right. And then eventually 20 years in, we do this meta analysis and we look at all the studies and like, what does the consensus really show? And so, and I think people are biased and they cherry pick, you know, what they, what they want to believe. But I, I'll tell you, Paul, I get, a handful of patients every single week. I'm in Omaha, Nebraska. I'm, I'm a gynecologist. A handful of patients every single week that come to me because I'm boarded in ketogenic therapy. And they're like, listen, my HDL is 80, my triglycerides are 42, and my LDL is 205, and my doctor's recommending a statin. What do you think about that? And we do additional testing, inflammatory markers are normal, fasting insulin is normal, all the things are normal. And then I say, well, let's do a coronary artery calcium scan. And then I send them for that. And then it comes back and it's zero. And we're doing all the tests and we can't find any, you know, any evidence of heart disease, but they're terrified. They're terrified because their doctor's like, if you don't start the statin, you know, something's going to happen to you. And then on the flip side of that coin, I have a family member who has had high cholesterol their whole life, unknown if it was familial hypercholesterolemia, but has been on a statin since statins were invented and encouraged them to go get a coronary calcium scan. And their score is like off. They have tons of atherosclerosis. But they've been on a statin since statins were invented, right? This was like supposed to prevent this issue. And it didn't at all. And now they have prediabetes and uh, I think some mild cognitive impairment from the use of the statins. And so um, what causes heart disease? <laughs> If it's not LDL. <laughs> yeah, let me just preface that with, because you mentioned um, familial hypercholesterolemia. So that's a very interesting rabbit hole to go down. Um, if you look at familial hypercholesterolemia, there are over 2,000 polymorphisms, 3,000 polymorphisms that cause familial hypercholesterolemia. The main ones are LDL receptor and a few others, uh, CETP, things like that, I think. But the problem is that a lot of these mutations in familial hypercholesterolemia also affect lipid metabolism. So they affect macrophages and monocytes and the avidity with which they take up LDL and become foam cells, or they make people hypercoagulable. So just as a, as a proxy or as, a, as a, a technical point there, familial hypercholesterolemia is a very poor uh, model system for elevated LDL because it doesn't occur within normal lipoprotein metabolism. But there are some cases which are quite interesting. And I can show you the, the case report of this. Some mutations in familial hypercholesterolemia seem to exclusively raise LDL. And there are case reports of people in their 70s with LDLs of 300, 400, 500 for their whole life who have CACs of zero. Mm -hmm. So if, if LDL is directly injurious to the, to, the, to the endothelium, then how is that possible, right? Now you could say, well, there's a lot of people with hypercholesterolemia who don't have that, who have lots of atherosclerosis. And I would say, well, show me their polymorphism and show me, prove to me their lipoprotein metabolism is normal. And then specifically, this gets a little technical, so just hold your hand up if it gets too technical. I don't know if you remember the glycogen storage diseases from medical school, but there's GSD1A is a glycogen storage disease that has um, elevated LDL. And you can see these people have no elevated incidence of cardiovascular disease. So it's genetically elevated LDL due to a glycogen storage disease 
with no elevated incidence of, of heart disease in these people at all. So what's going on there, right? That there's just so many points of evidence that, that really attack the notion that LDL is directly injurious to the endothelium. So if we back up, your question is really well taken. What causes yeah, what's that? injuring it? What is injuring it? I, I think that it's it's pretty clear that it's 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 insulin resistance, but I think that the the better word there is metabolic dysfunction. And that happens at the level of the mitochondria, it happens at the level of everything. So and you know, insulin resistance, I don't like the word insulin resistance or the phrase insulin resistance, basically. We know that during ketogenic diets, you develop physiologic insulin resistance, right. which is normal. That's normal human physiology, but there's something called pathologic insulin resistance, which happens when you are metabolically unwell. And that is accompanied by excess gluconeogenesis in the liver. And you know, there is actual, uh, that's, that's pathological insulin resistance. So I think you can differentiate those by saying metabolic dysfunction. So I think metabolic dysfunction is the ultimate root cause. Mechanistically, we don't fully understand. There are many, many compelling hypotheses to suggest this. There is, I mean, I think that we know that a few things must happen for atherosclerosis to progress. The endothelium must become damaged and not repaired properly. And then particles must accumulate in the subendothelial space. So right now we're talking about within an artery because in a vein, you don't get atherosclerosis. Um, at least when they're in low pressure, but you can take a vein and you can transplant it into an arterial circulation and that vein will develop atherosclerosis very rapidly. This happens in coronary artery bypass surgery. But if LDL is directly injurious to the endothelium, then why do veins not develop atherosclerosis? Because there's the equivalent amount of LDL circulating in veins and arteries in the human body. There has to be something else going on. And so the, the most compelling hypothesis here is that arteries are higher pressure. And so with higher pressure, they develop more um, injury to the endothelium, more shear stress at corners or branch points of these vessels. So arteries develop atherosclerosis, veins do not. So that's one hypothesis that I think is reasonable, but we're all developing endothelial um, you know, uh, damage to our arteries at all times. It's just part of being a human. I think there's associated with metabolic dysfunction is delay and problems with the repair of that endothelial dysfunction. It doesn't turn over, it doesn't heal as well. We know this, diabetics don't heal their wounds. Why? Immune system is, you know, programmatically problematic, all these kinds of things. So there's, I think that it's endothelial dysfunction that happens in all of us that is not properly repaired due to slowed wound healing due to metabolic dysfunction. And then below the endothelium, you have the subintimal space. So the endothelium is one or two cell layers thick. Then you have the intima in which reside immune cells, these macrophages, these monocytes. And when they see an oxidized LDL particle, they take it up. That's part of the response. They become a foam cell. This is at least the canonical understanding of the progression of atherosclerosis. Now, it appears there's another hypothesis that in people who are metabolically unwell, uh, insulin resistant, again, not the best term, metabolically dysfunctional, that in that subendothelial space, you get increased deposition of proteoglycans that make LDL a little more sticky. LDL gets different apolipoproteins on it that make it sticky. And then that sub space becomes more sticky because of more proteoglycans. So there's the, the second part of it is like, there's more LDL, um, there's more injury to the endothelium. There's probably more LDL in the subendothelial space. There's more LDL getting stuck in the subendothelial space. And again, these macrophages are probably affected differently when metabolic when they're metabolically, metabolically dysfunctional, and they're taking up more of the LDL in the subendothelial space. This is not to say that LDL is not involved in atherosclerosis, but LDL is not the thing that injures the endothelium, right? And this is also not to say that if you have someone with an atherosclerotic process, it's also possible that if LDL, if you have a metabolically dysfunctional human and you lower the amount of LDL and LDL is a participant, that might improve atherosclerosis, but that doesn't mean that LDL caused it, right? So there's all of this nuance people need to understand. And that doesn't mean you want to lower LDL if you're otherwise healthy because of all the other good things that it does for humans. So I think that what we see is metabolic dysfunction causes atherosclerosis, that's pretty darn clear. Metabolic dysfunction causes so many things. And then mechanistically, you can delve into all these mechanisms by which LDL can arrive at that subendothelial space. Some people even believe that LDL doesn't even arrive through the endothelium, that it arrives through the vasovasorum, through the other side of the blood vessel. And that's possible too. And that somehow you get neovascularization because when you have metabolic dysfunction, that subintimal space expands, you get hypertrophy in that subintimal space and it becomes a little bit ischemic and you get neovascularization of the basovasorum, which is the complete other side of the artery. So this is probably quite technical for people, but yeah. 
there are, there are blood vessels in your blood vessels. There are arteries that supply your arteries because your arteries have a muscular wall. Uh, I, so because your arteries are so thick with muscles, they need blood vessels to supply the blood vessels. And that is called the vasovasorum. So there's uh, Vladimir Sabotin, I believe, is the man who has suggested this, this hypothesis that it's possible that LDL arrives through the vasovasorum as well through the other direction because this subintimal layer expands and then gets neovascularized and it's not really supposed to be vascularized and then it gets stuck in that space. But common to all of these is this notion that the proximate event is probably metabolic dysfunction. And what, are we, what is metabolic dysfunction? Well, that's another issue we can delve into if you want. Does that make sense? Do you have a question? Yeah. Can I clarify so, that? Yeah, so for the people that are listening, majority of the time people transition to ketogenic carnivore-ish carnivore diet and they start to see these lipid changes. LDL is going up. Usually HDL is also coming up. Triglycerides are going down. Fasting insulin is improving. I'm the anomaly. I make the vegan cardiologist head spin because my LDL went down. <laughs> so my LDL is actually below hundred on a carnivore diet. Um, but I, I think I'm probably the outlier. And sometimes I'm like, I don't know, is this a good thing? Like, you know, you like, you read all these studies that people with lower LDL, like have higher mortality. So I don't know, maybe, but, um, but what advice do you have for people that transition to this type of diet and, and see this happen? What should they do? So like you, like you talked about, um, talk to your physician, but make sure, sure your physician understands what's going on here. If you <clears throat> say the word metabolic health or metabolic dysfunction and your physician's eyes glaze over, you don't have the right physician. If your physician has never drawn a fasting insulin on you, you don't have the right physician. I don't think that we should be teaching medical students to interpret a lipid panel without the context of a fasting insulin. Mm -hmm. And at least what we should be doing is <clears throat> teaching them that the triglycerides and the HDL Give the L, give the lipid panel context, and that that you should not evaluate LDL in isolation ever. It's always contextual. This is not to say that there are not people out there with an elevated LDL who are metabolically unwell, and that's a recipe for a problem, right? Whether your LDL is 200 or 300 or 100, if you're metabolically unwell, you are going to likely develop atherosclerosis. And if you look at people who are metabolically unwell, your level of LDL doesn't necessarily correlate all the time with the rapidity with which you develop atherosclerosis. So people with LDLs of 80 and 90 develop atherosclerosis, you know, because they, they continue to have this metabolic dysfunction and whether it's endothelial damage is not repaired or expansion of the intima, hypo, you know, neovascularization or excess proteoglycans in the intima, all these mechanisms, there, even with an LDL of 100, you're still accumulating LDL. And what people don't understand is the number 100 and the number 200 don't sound like they're, they sound like they're very different. But these are, if you look at the particle counts, you're looking at 10 to the 16 or 10 to the 17 particles of LDL. So we're looking at really, really big numbers. An LDL of 100 milligrams per deciliter, I'm, I'm ballparking, I think I've done this calculation, is something like one times 10 to the 16th or one times 10 to the 17th particles of LDL in your body. And an LDL of 200 is two times seven, 10 to the 17th particles of LDL in your body. So yes, it's twice as many particles of LDL, but one times 10 to the 17th is still a whole lot of LDL. And you're telling me that, that two times 10 to the 17th is enough to give you atherosclerosis, but one times 10 to the 17th is not, you know, it's too much. Like there's more LDL particles in your body than there are cells in the human body, apparently, because there's only 10 to the 15th cells in the human body. So you already have an order of magnitude equivalent or more cells in your body with LDL. And you're telling me, wait a minute, but if we double that, that's what causes atherosclerosis. It's like, well, maybe, but that's a hard argument to make like this, this geometric increase in LDL is what causes it. I don't, I don't buy that at all. So I think that the, the answer is if you see your LDL going up, understand that metabolic health is the context and use a continuous glucose monitor. Um, you get, get lipids done with HDL and triglycerides, get a CAC scan if you're curious, uh, get a CT coronary angiogram, get a fasting insulin, and then you'll know. And then triangulate that with how you feel because what we're not telling people here is that most of the people who do this feel really good. <laughs> they lose weight, they look good, they feel good, they have libido back, they have energy back, and they go to the doctor and the doctor says, you look great, what are you doing? They say, well, you know, I'm, I'm eating a lot of meat. And they say, stop doing that. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so I went through traditional nutrition training as well, I have a degree in nutrition. And when I went through, it was, first of all, don't eat a lot of fat. But when you do eat fat, eat a smaller percent of saturated fat and eat more monounsaturated and polyunsaturated fats. How, where did we get this wrong? 
I think we got it wrong because of the focus on LDL. And one of the things that we know is that polyunsaturated fats like seed oils lower LDL. And saturated fats tend to raise LDL, though not exclusively, like there are outliers like your case, but genetically, usually in the majority of people that I've seen, saturated fats do raise LDL. And my LDL tends to go between 200 and I've had it as high as 500, but usually it's 200. I was after a really hard workout. I have no idea why it went to 500. Um, my triglycerides are usually 75. My HDL is usually between 85 and 100. And my fasting insulin is usually less than three. But I think that we have gotten so focused on LDL that we've lost sight of what's going on with the LDL and other metrics of LDL quality, if you will. So there's a great study that I've talked about many times in the past where they reduce people's saturated fat and they increase their polyunsaturated fat. And what they see is that the LDL goes down, but the amount of oxidized LDL goes up and the amount of LP little a goes up. So even stalwarts like Peter Atia can't argue with that. And I don't know how they would reconcile that study. Like you're lowering LDL, but raising oxidized LDL and LP little a. And so a sure way to lower your LDL is to, to eat corn oil or canola oil or seed oils, that, that will lower your LDL. I mean, I shudder to think what your LDL would be if you ate polyunsaturated fat. I bet your LDL would be even lower if you did that. It might even be 60 or 70. You just may be someone genetically that has a low LDL or a high LDL turnover. And so, but I think what's happening here is LDL has been the, the main metric at the detriment of everything else. There's no association with metabolic health. No one is looking at oxidized LDL or specifically you should really look at oxidized phospholipids on ApoB particles. And so this is the problem. This is why saturated fat has been vilified. This has started with Ansel Keys, right? It raises your cholesterol, except it also raises your HDL and lowers your triglycerides. And it probably raises your testosterone and makes you feel better and gives you great skin and helps you lose weight. And it has stearic acid in it. You know, like animal fat is incredibly beneficial. People think of fat as fat as fat. But one of the things that I've tried to talk about in my work and on my podcast is this idea that animal fat has all of these unique nutrients. And again, think about this through an evolutionary lens. If you starve humans of stearic acid, they've done studies with this. There's a study in nature where they took people and they put them on a vegan diet for three days. They give them no stearic acid, which is a, I believe it's an 18 carbon saturated fatty acid. And their mitochondria changed in a negative way. They stopped burning fat, they, they split apart, and then you give them stearic acid back in a smoothie and their mitochondria turn on. Uh, blood acyl carnitines go down, suggesting they're doing fatty acid beta oxidation. They're burning fat. Stearic acid causes humans to burn fat and turns mitochondria on. There is an 18 carbon saturated fatty acid that excludes uh, that occurs almost exclusively in saturated animal fats or in concert with saturated animal fats. Animal fats that are high in saturated fat, I should say. That is really beneficial for humans that we never talk about. Stearic acid is a nutrient for humans, but we never talk about that. It also occurs in cocoa butter, um, but if you ever tried cocoa butter, it's like chewing like gum and it doesn't really taste that good. So well, you can like maybe it's the keto. I mean, keto brick is probably my, my main source of cocoa. Butter. Does it have, does it have cocoa butter in it? Yeah. It's a lot of stearic acid in it. Yeah. It has a lot of stearic acid. That's great. So it does occur in some plant foods, but that's about the only one that I'm aware of. Um, and it's mostly in tallow, which is derived from the, the kidney fat, the stearic acid rich uh, suet of animals, like the, the kidney fat of animals, which is also kind of sticky if you just try and chew it. You don't melt it or mix it with another fat. But so animal fat is usually about half saturated, half mono, and very small poly, one to 2% poly in like tallow. And but the problem is that plant oils are often much, much higher amounts of mono uh, and then poly and almost no saturated or a small amount of saturated. I think olive oil, I'm going to ballpark this. Tell me if I get it wrong. I think olive oil is like 20% saturated fat, 15, 16. So there is some saturated fat in plant foods. It's just the ratios. But even beyond that, the individual fats are valuable. I was actually just reading, have you heard of um, odd chain fatty acids like pentadecanoic acid? Yeah, yeah. So again, exclusively, almost exclusively occurring in animal foods and very valuable for humans. Fat molecules are nutrients for humans and the animal fat molecules are nutrients. So if you don't think about this from an evolutionary lens, you're not really thinking about, you won't ask the right questions. And if you don't ask the right questions, you won't find, if you don't turn over the right rocks, you won't find things that you need to find. So social media world has watched the evolution of Paul Saladino's diet over the last couple of years and for better or for worse, you know, lovers, haters, <laughs> don't, don't eat any plants. Plants are evil. Plants have anti-nutrients. Um, and then now you're incorporating fruits and honey. And I know you've talked about this in other places, but 
how many carbs should people eat? How do people find their carbohydrate threshold and what types of carbs that come from plants uh, would be most appropriate? Good question. I don't think we fully know, but it's interesting to think about. And I don't know if you and I will have the same opinion on this, but we can certainly share and dialogue about it. So I think that for humans, ketosis is um, challenging long-term for many humans. Uh, There are signals that insulin does at the level of the kidney that lead to retention of uh, minerals and electrolytes that are critical. And so for a lot of people, if you continue to not signal um, with insulin, and if you do a ketogenic diet, your insulin will be low all day. You might get a little bump when you eat protein, but it's going to be a very low insulin all day. Now, if you eat a carnivore-ish diet with meat, organs, fruit, and honey, you're going to have a low insulin most of the day, but when you eat fruit and honey, you're going to spike your insulin. And people think of that as a bad thing. And I say, no, it's not, it's good. That insulin actually has very important roles. People use insulin in the Tour de France as a performance enhancing drug and increases glutathione, increases muscle. It's not anabolic, it's anti-catabolic um, insulin is, but it's, it's, a, it's a good hormone to have in a, in a phasic way, on off. Pulses of insulin I think are very good for humans. Always having insulin on is a bad idea. We know that. Um, But phasic insulin is beneficial. And one of the reasons phasic insulin is beneficial is because of the kidney. It signals to the kidney to resorb sodium and magnesium and potassium and the electrolytes you need. It's very, very hard in my experience. And feel free to chime in if you disagree with this for people to maintain their electrolyte balance optimally, even if they are taking tons and tons of electrolyte supplements when they are strictly ketogenic. Now, having said that, I will say ketogenic diets, great for people with end-stage mitochondrial disease like Parkinson's or Alzheimer's, things like this, fantastic. Like you, you, must, you must bypass your mitochondrial, uh, you know, you must bypass aer- aerobic- For children with epilepsy. If yeah, you yeah, 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 you must therapeutic bypass- Therapeutic ketosis or you'll start seizing, then you need therapeutic ketosis. Even adults with seizure disorders often benefit from, um, you know, from ketogenic diet. So it's a really interesting tool at the level of mitochondrial biochemistry. For, for those of us that are that do not have end-stage mitochondrial illness, um, I think incorporating carbohydrates um, in a phasic pattern can also be beneficial f- because of the reasons I enumerated and because of the signals that it gives insulin, again, glutathione, hormones. We see this frequently in humans. So then the question is, what source of carbohydrates? And this is a big set of debate. I mean, I'm already squarely, not ostracized, but not looked upon friendly, in a friendly manner by the carnivore or keto communities because the keto community would say that honey is just the same as Coca-Cola. And I would say, whoa, 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 you know, like, hold on, sea bass. Like, that's not true. You can look at studies with honey and it's completely different. It has nitrogen. That's like saying beyond meat and a steak or both meat. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. It's, it's not the same. There's a conflation there. So honey has nitric oxide precursors. I think if you look at the literature, like I mentioned earlier, if you look at the literature with fruit and honey, with carbohydrates, that is even simple carbohydrates, in a food matrix, they, they do seem to have beneficial effects in, in humans and, and non-detrimental effects in humans. So what sources of carbohydrates are best for us as humans? So I think, how can I get carbohydrates with the most nutrients uh, and the least number of toxins? And my solution to that problem has been, okay, um, I think that fruit and honey are the least toxic sources of that. Uh, we talked about fructose and um, I can go down that rabbit hole more and try and dispel more of the fear around fructose. But suffice it to say that in summary, the Cliff Notes answer is that if you look at the medical literature, like I said, um, there are there's really no medical literature to support fructose, sugar, quote unquote, uh, glucose, sucrose in a food matrix being harmful for humans. There appear to be other things in the fruit that help give our body information and help us understand how to process that or mitigate the damage, whether it's nitric oxide precursors at the level of the endothelium, it's a fascinating thing. Um, and you see hunter-gatherer groups like the Hadza that do not get, you know, they do not get <clears throat> metabolically unwell. They do not get diabetes when they have um, a lot of fruit or carbohydrates in their diet. There's a tribe in Africa called the Mbuti that at certain times of the year get 85% of their calories from honey and they remain metabolically healthy. So people will often try and couch this with nuance and say, oh, well, it's the amount. And I think, no, it's not the amount. And fruit isn't, isn't just better because you can eat less of it. I think it's just that there's something, it's a completely different piece of information package. It's a totally different program run by this intelligence of our body than uh, sucrose or Coca-Cola or maple syrup, which is heated or, you know, Aunt Jemima's syrup. So it's a completely different piece of information coming into our body. So I look at that and go, okay, I think fruit and honey are a good source of carbohydrates for humans. People say, well, I don't want 
to spike my glucose. And then we go down the rabbit hole of like, why don't you want to spike your glucose? I don't think it's a problem um, to, to spike quote unquote, your glucose every once in a while, you will remain metabolically healthy. I did a, a continuous glucose monitor podcast um, recently on my show. And um, we talked about the fact that if you really look at the data, it doesn't totally support the notion that there is an absolute ceiling for glucose other than maybe 180 or 200. And most humans with normal metabolic function, even if you eat a few tablespoons of honey or a handful of grapes or some blueberries, I mean, what did I have for breakfast this morning? I had, um, I'm doing dairy in my diet now, which we can talk about. So I had some raw milk. I actually had <clears throat> camel's milk and buffalo colostrum, which is amazing. And then I had some Parmesan cheese. I had two grass-fed burgers and I had uh, maybe two or three tablespoons of honey, a handful of blueberries. And I mean like a big handful of blueberries and some grapes. So I definitely had a pretty good amount of carbohydrates this morning, none of which were complex, all of which contained fructose. And if I'd, I wasn't wearing a CGM, so I'm just going to guess that my blood sugar probably went to 140 or 150. I've never seen when I've done meals like that, when I have worn CGMs in the past, that it goes much above 150, maybe 160, but it never goes to 180 or 200. So there is an absolute ceiling, but it's much higher than people think of it. Within some of these CGM circles, the continuous glucose monitor circles, people think, I don't want my blood sugar to ever go over 110. Well, I'm just not sure there's good literature to support that. Like, that's great, but what are you sacrificing? It means you can't ever eat honey. You probably can't ever eat more than 10 blueberries or whatever. And I don't think that's a bad thing for you. So there is nuance here. And I think it has more to do with the, let's just say the, 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 um, <clears throat> the phenotype of the postprandial glucose curve. That is the area under the curve. And this is getting right. into technical. How, long does it, how high does it go yeah. and how long does it stay there? That's exactly. Hard. And then you can integrate, you know, if you could turn that over and pour water into it, what's the volume of water that you could pour into the curve upside down? <clears throat> so, yeah, I think that there's a lot of, um, there's a lot to dig into there with nuance. Some people might select white rice. I think if you want to do a grain-based carbohydrate, white rice is probably the best. Uh, the brown rice is quite high in arsenic. You don't want brown rice. White rice is basically dextrose, though it's going to have some lectins. It's going to have some mycotoxins in it. So that's why it's lower down on my list. If you pressure cook white rice, it's probably pretty darn safe for humans. Um, and that probably is going to give you less of a glucose response if that's important to you. Again, I would urge you to really think about that carefully and find a single study that can show that an absolute glucose of 150 or 160 is suddenly injurious to the endothelium of a human. Again, think about this through an evolutionary lens. I'm with the Hadza and we're hunting for baboons and they find a, a, a beehive. And those guys like ate, went, those guys went ham. They went to town. Uh, they, they ate a lot of honey very quickly in the comb. I mean, they ate honeycombs that were probably the size of a basketball, like, you know, in terms of diameter within 10 seconds, they're just eating the whole thing. They're not like, oh, I don't know about my, my glucose is going to do right now. I'm going to save some of this honeycomb for later. There's no way honey's like sticky. They're not going to put it in their shorts. Like they're going to eat the honeycomb completely in that moment. And so you have to think like as humans, we would have been exposed to massive inputs of, of fructose and honey. And it's possible that that is temporarily injurious to the endothelium, but I haven't seen a whole lot to suggest that it actually is in the whole food form. Now, well, but once again, Paul, you have to, once again, with this context thing is that the Hadza are physically hunting and gathering, and they're not sitting on their couch and playing on their smartphone and like doing all these things. And so I think that's the hard part too. When we look at these hunter gather populations is people say like, Oh, honey is good. But then you have John who's, you know, obese, diabetic. And he's like, cool. Paul says I can have honey. So it's like, you know, I think it's so individualized. And I tell patients all the time, listen, nobody got diabetes from eating blueberries and carrots. I said this on another podcast the other day, like the overarching problem, right. Is the addition of like processed flours, additional sugars, and all these foods. They're not like real whole foods, seed oils, seed oils, vegetable <laughs> oils, canola oil, yeah. grape oil that's replaced, you know, everything that's in a a bag, a box, you know, inside the middle of the grocery store. So um, let's get back to the plants for just a second. You have a history of uh, autoimmune skin conditions. You've talked about that in, in some of your work. I totally agree. There are patients with autoimmune conditions that avoidance of a lot of plants really helps improve. Like vulvodynia is when we see in gynecology where these women get this really like itchy condition of their vulva. Um, I had a patient literally, I was like, what are you eating? 24 hour recall every single morning, a giant handful of spinach, almond milk, this like big <laughs> oxalate smoothie. 
and we eliminated it and it got better literally within a couple of days. It was gone. Um, so who does everybody really need to avoid these plants? I mean, or do you think it's a small percentage of the population? Uh, yeah, I'm happy to come to that. Can I just mention the honey and diabetes? This is, you brought up a good point that I don't want to gloss over. So I do think context is important. Obviously, if you are diabetic, you are already metabolically unhealthy. Most of our conversation has been about people who are metabolically healthy, healthy. Right? and the inclusion of athletes and performance of these foods. If you are metabolically unhealthy, it's not to say that I don't think you can eat these foods, but once you get to that point, the scale starts to tip more toward lower carbohydrate, at least temporarily. I think you're going to have to get rid of seed oils religiously, and it's going to take time. And in that case, lower carbohydrate may be beneficial, but still some carbohydrates, I think, are going to be important in the diet. Now, there is an interesting study with diabetes. I can find it and send it to you for the show notes. They did actually give honey to diabetics. And the results were interesting. They improved their insulin sensitivity, but the A1C went up a little bit. So obviously in a diabetic, honey will raise your blood sugar, which is going to raise your A1C, but metrics of insulin sensitivity improved. So you find this sort of... Um, um, uh, this sort of uh, paradoxical change, right? And I think that over time, a diabetic possibly could eat moderate amounts of honey as long as they're doing other things. I think if you are metabolically health, unhealthy, metabolically dysfunctional, if you eat carbohydrates, your sugar will go up. You have impaired glucose handling. We know that. The way to fix that, I think, is probably temporarily lower to the carbohydrates and get rid of the seed oils. But if you are metabolically healthy, you should tolerate these things. Hopefully that makes sense to people, and I should have clarified that earlier. So thanks for pointing that out. But And you're talking about honey. raw, unrefined honey, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Super raw, unrefined honey because... Not the cute little Winnie the Pooh thing at the grocery no. store. <laughs> No, no. So this is interesting. You know, they've they've actually done studies looking at these nitric oxide precursors in honey, and the the more it's heated and the lighter the honey is, the less of these there are. So it's quite fascinating to think like, what is the connection between nitric oxide and and insulin resistance or metabolic dysfunction? But my hypothesis is that something in the honey, whether it's these nitric oxide precursors that also occur in fruit, perhaps, is again, abrogating the negative effects of fructose and kind of balancing it out as it would evolutionarily. So it's probably okay occasionally, but I don't think honey should be a staple for a diabetic human. That person really needs to focus on meat and organs um, and, and the nutrients and then occasional carbohydrates. Yeah, eat some blueberries, eat some carrots, you'd probably be fine. And then long-term, I think that you could probably get back to that when your metabolic health is better and they could fix that. So, okay, yeah. that one. Now, your question is well taken. Who needs to worry about plant toxins? Certainly the people that have autoimmune disease or have symptoms, this is where it's most applicable. If you have vulvodynia, vulvodynia, um, if you have eczema, I, I had eczema, if you have psoriasis, if you have Sjogren's, whatever condition, like you gotta think that a lot of these could be caused by oxalates, lectins, is your gut messed up. If you are a freaking hale and hearty individual with no issues, who am I to tell you what to change in your diet, right? But here's what I would say. If you're really, really kicking butt, if you're a CrossFit Games athlete and you, you have a diet that might include grains or kale, here's what I'm going to say to you. Maybe you could be better. And think about it from the perspective of what is the hierarchy of plant food value or just overall food value. If you are kicking that much butt and you're a Games athlete or you're an elite athlete or a BJJ, whatever you do, or just a kick-ass house mom, you know, like house mom that just takes care of their kids or an engineer or a financial planner or whatever, but you're doing really good. Number one, I think you could probably be better. And why wouldn't you eat the most nutrient-rich foods in exclusion of the foods that are less nutrient-rich and more full of these plant defense molecules? So the, the urgency equation is different for people who are already doing really good and are healthy. But to me, it just makes sense from a first principles perspective that the people that are doing good and healthy, if they're listening to your podcast, understand that, hey, you might want to optimize this even more or optimize it for the long term. You want longevity in your health. Who's to say you won't develop issues? Why would you knowingly eat foods? If you accept what I'm saying, maybe you debate what I'm saying, right? But if you accept the, the, the things I'm throwing out there, then why would you knowingly eat foods that are less than optimal, that are lower down on the food totem pole, that are lower down on the hierarchy? Why eat survival food or starving food when you could eat thriving food or abundance food. And I would say meat, organs, fruit, honey, these are abundance foods. These are the first foods that our ancestors always go for. You can ask the Hadza this question. You can say, what do you dream about? Meat. What's your favorite food? Meat and organs. What's, what's the best day of your life? The day that I kill and hunt the biggest animal. That's it. 
Like those are the best foods. And if you're out there hunting, they're going to eat honey. They're going to eat fruit. Like those are the abundance foods. And you can eat survival foods if you want. And the Hadza will eat pumpkin leaves occasionally, but you better believe they're eating pumpkin leaves when their hunts aren't successful and they haven't found any fruit or honey. So it's like, okay, like, do you want to be, you know, do you want to be in that time period? And people might say, well, maybe it's good for us to get those foods occasionally. I don't buy that argument. I feel like the nutrients and the information you give your body is, is ideal and optimal from the, the, really the abundance foods. Why eat lower down on the totem pole? And we can get into whatever, where you want to go from here. Cause there's a lot of, a lot of branch points. So what is a, what does a modern carnivore ish diet look in 2021 for somebody listening? I think it looks like well-raised meat and organs. So hopefully Does it have to voting, be grass fed. Vote with your dollars, you know, like <laughs> you cannot abstain from voting with your dollars. You're eating either voting for Monsanto, Bayer, Unilever, Nestle, and multinational corporations with your dollars, or you're voting for farms like White Oak Pastures or other regenerative farms. And if you think that grass-fed grass finish is too expensive, I challenge you to go to Whole Foods or another store. You can find grass-fed ground beef for five to seven dollars a pound, which is pretty cheap for most people. And I think that that vote with your dollars, yeah, you could find traditional ground beef for three. <laughs> But that extra three to four dollars is your vote for this ecosystem-based form of agriculture that is healthier for everyone involved: animals, um, land, ecosystems, um, everything involved. Your family, like, and people say, "Oh, the nutrition isn't that much different." Well, I debate that, and I think that it's also about what you're not getting when you're getting grass-fed food. You're getting grass-finished food. Like, grain-finished animals are eating grains that are probably sprayed with pesticides and have mold toxins. And so you're, you're getting different things with the grain fed meat. And you, I think that grass fed meat is more about toxin avoidance than um, more nutrients necessarily. Though there is some, there are some studies that the grass fed meat does have more chemicals in it that are probably beneficial for humans. I did a podcast with Stefan Van Vliet about this. So lots of reasons to eat grass fed meat. You got to get organs. You can't just eat meat. And even if you're eating good otherwise you got to get organs you got to start with a little bit of liver you got to get some bone marrow what organs what organs i mean there's a lot of organs in the body there are a lot of <laughs> organs so i would start with liver and heart and bone marrow those would be the three to start with and then you can move on and, and go further but um this is where things like desiccated organs come into play you know if people can't get the organs so start with fresh if you can and in terms of how much i would say you know half an ounce of liver a day a couple of ounces of liver a week Fresh liver will be a game changer. A little bit of bone marrow every week will be a game changer. A couple of ounces of heart a few times a week is a game changer. Um, these all are very high in things like folate and riboflavin and choline and unique nutrients that don't occur in muscle meat or in plant foods that you really can't miss out on. And if you really want to go down the rabbit hole, you know, there's a lot of benefits probably for men and women, but especially for men and eating testicle, which is fascinating. Um, and then for women, you can even eat things like ovary and uterus and fallopian tubes. Um, hard to get fresh, more you're going to get those in like a desiccated organ supplement. Um, and then you can do um, things like brain are interesting. Uh, there's a lot of unique nutrients in brain. There's a lot of phosphatidylserine, which is really well studied. In fact, bovine cortex derived phosphatidylserine. So serine that is phosphatidylserine that is essentially from desiccated cow brains um, has been studied and found to attenuate, attenuate age-related cognitive decline in the elderly. So it's a powerful molecule and so eating brain is critical, but how many people are going to eat brain? Again, this is probably something better to get in a desiccated form in like a capsule for people if it makes it easier. Fresh is always better, but desiccated makes it more convenient. And then you can go on. If you have gut issues, we see a lot of improvements when people do tripe or stomach. What are the unique nutrients there? We know that this peptide everybody talks about, BPC-157, actually occurs in the stomach of animals. So you're getting a desiccated tripe, you know, and, and intestine supplement, you're getting BPC-157. So if you've got stuff, maybe eat some, you know, GI organs, uh, the list goes on. I mean, there's benefits to kidney, there's benefits to spleen. Spleen is a super great source of heme iron. So, you know, most people are not going to eat all of these organs fresh. If you're going to eat organs fresh, I would say heart, liver, bone marrow is the place to start. Um, if you want to go into to really getting exciting with your organs, think about desiccated organs. Um, and beyond that, I mean, there's really not a lot of organs that don't have benefit. And believe me, when I was with the Hadza, we ate everything. <laughs> the day after we we hunted a baboon, I ate the baboon brains. I've yet to come down with prion disease, thankfully, but hopefully we'll <laughs> avoid that. Uh, there's no prion diseases in, in baboons that have ever been known to transmit to humans, thankfully. I learned that fact after I ate the baboon brain. Um, so there's a lot of good organs out there. And I think you just, you do what you can. And if you can't get the fresh, you get desiccated, you know, I like a company like Hardened Soil will get you the desiccated organs just fine. 
So meat, organs, honey, berries. What else you got? Uh, so meat, organs, fruit, honey is kind of the adage. So you have honey, it should be raw, it should be organic, preferably local, really dark honey. And then the fruit. And the fruit is going to be seasonal based on what you what you have. And again, think about the fruit on the, like the dirty dozen. Don't buy non-organic strawberries or berries. You could get berries. Grapes are in season now. I ate some grapes here. I'm in Texas right now. Um, and then you could do, you can do things like eggs, but in terms of fruit, yeah, do what you like. You can do, or you can do oranges, pineapple, whatever you want to do for fruit. Um, see how it works with you. I've found personally that I do great with grapes. When I'm back in the States, I do great with grapes. I'm okay with bananas, pretty good with blueberries and fine with, um, what else? Oranges. But if I do apples and pears, something about the pectin just gives me gas. So I don't do well with that kind of fruit. So experiment with the fruit, see what works for you. When I'm in Costa Rica, I get the best bananas I've ever had on the planet and I get ripe local papaya. So papaya is not really a tropical fruit you can get here, but uh, I'm sure there's not a lot of papaya in Omaha, Nebraska. But no, uh, I get- well, Fresh out, fresh out. Of <laughs> fresh out. I get a lot in Costa Rica. So I do more tropical fruit there. And then there's other foods that we haven't even talked about. Things like eggs are great. You can do fish if you want. Just make sure that it's um, low mercury fish. Um, and I would not make the majority of your diet fish because they're just also contaminated. And then you can do things like dairy if you tolerate it. And for the longest time- Say dairy, what you mean by that. Dairy, um, milk, cheeses, yogurts. All do you think there's of- just people that have lactase deficiencies and that's why they don't tolerate it? Or is that a microbiome gut issue or- I think it's all of the above and probably some people have a genetic issue or a yeah, genetics that don't tolerate the casein and the whey very well. So um, I did a recent podcast with Bill Schindler and he kind of rekindled my interest in this. I've tried dairy multiple times and it's never worked. It's always seemed to re, um, re flare my eczema. Mm. But this time I started out and I only did one cheese and it was Parmigiano Reggiano. And the reason I did Parmigiano Reggiano was because it's grass fed and it's it's grass fed, it's raw, and it's it's fermented properly. So there's a lot of cheeses that are not fermented. They use uh, lactic acid to separate the curds in the way. They're not actually real cheeses. People can hear this on the podcast I did with Bill on my podcast. But I was like, okay, if there's a real artisan cheese out there that I can get everywhere, it's Parmigiano Reggiano. So I started out with Parmigiano Reggiano. Why did I want to include cheese in my diet? I did a podcast with Sally and Kay Norton recently about oxalates, and I was reminded that having calcium in your gut is a good thing for a variety of reasons. Definitely calcium in the gut seems to be important and seems to reduce your risk of colon cancer. We didn't go down the meat and colon cancer thing in this podcast. Again, it's a fallacy, but in general, having calcium in your gut also decreases your absorption of oxalate. So like, I think having calcium is important for humans. I was doing bone matrix from heart and soil. So I was doing our like our bone meal supplement, but I wanted to try cheese because cheese has more benefits like K2. And there's a lot of other things in cheese that I wanted to try and increase in my diet. Um, so I started with Parmigiano Reggiano. It didn't seem to flare my eczema. I've been doing it about maybe two weeks now almost. So that's good. And once I got back to Texas, I tried some raw milk and raw colostrum. And this morning I had camel milk and buffalo colostrum. You got camels down there in Texas? Yeah, I got camels in Texas. <laughs> Texas camels. I brought all, I got my Costa Rican camels. No, so I've been trying dairy for those reasons. And so I have been experimenting with exclusively raw dairy. And I started out with a fermented dairy in the form of cheese. And now I've gone to raw milk and raw colostrum. And it seems to be okay for me. Some people may be lactose deficient, uh, you know, lactase deficient, and you can just go very slowly or do the fermented cheeses, which are going to be lower. But you got to realize that like, I'm learning there's a lot of nuance with dairy. Like, are you sensitive to pasteurized dairy? Because most dairy in the grocery store is going to be pasteurized. Are you sensitive to cow's milk and not sheep's milk? Maybe you can do something like a goat's milk dairy or or another cheese, right? And so I'm just, I'm a huge fan of colostrum. The ultimate goal of this was to get colostrum back in my diet. This first milk from, um, you know, from from animals is is immunoglobulin rich and has, uh, you know, all sorts of important peptides in it that I wanted to incorporate and I wanted to experience, I wanted to feel them again. I never tried it. And um, we have a great desiccated colostrum Uh, as well that people can take. And it's, that was what I wanted to really get back in my diet. So I thought I would try the dairy first and see if I can do it. And it's going well so far. So dairy is an option for people. If you tolerate, how do you know if you don't tolerate it? Massive gas, massive bloating, go to something that's more fermented. You could have a lactase deficiency or a recurrence of your immune symptoms. And if you get the recurrence of the immune systems, realize that not all dairy is created equally, that, that just getting yogurt from the store is not the same as, as, 
like a, a raw organic fermented thing like that. Do you do dairy? Yeah. And that's the trouble because availability, depending on, you know, where people live and, you know, what their budget's like, um, you know, that's a whole another podcast episode about, you know, sustainable or regenerative practices and things like that. I do do dairy. So like my, my story was, I started kind of full 30 and then paleo. And really, honestly, my diet is mostly carnivore ish, but I do, uh, sometimes, sometimes I'll add in like berries or even sweet potatoes and things like that. I have no autoimmune condition that I have to exclude plants. I, I don't feel well eating like large salads and things like that. And probably cause just what my microbiome, you know, just can't deal with those big leafy salads and things, but I, um, I do do some dairy. I mean, I enjoy cheese. Um, I can do some heavy cream and things like that. I don't, I feel fine when I do it. Um, there have been periods of time where I'll get some acne flares and things like that. And I do sometimes wonder if it's from that, but, um, it's hard in a woman who's cycling and there's so many variables and things like that. So, um, okay. So I'm a huge fan, obviously of an animal based diet. So as Dr. Saladino, one of the reasons I'm a really big proponent of it in my patients is because I take care of patients that are trying to get pregnant. And actually I had a patient, uh, Paul recently who said that they, they must've chatted you up on social media and asked about feeding like newborn babies or something. And you did a story on it, but, uh, in my, my last part of my episodes on the fit and fabulous podcast, we do something called the semen analysis. And I want to talk a little bit about the nutrient choline, which of course is found in almost double the amounts in animal foods than it is in plant foods. And in pregnancy, there were some recommendations they came out in 2018, looking at recommendations for choline consumption in pregnancy, and they it is massively, massively um, deficient in a lot of uh, pregnant people. And so they increased these recommendations, which basically meant that prenatal vitamin manufacturers had to figure out how to get more choline because that's what pregnant women these days rely on is not a nutrient dense diet. It's like take this prenatal vitamin and uh, your baby will be good. So I want to highlight choline. They're uh, Choline is so important, not only for membrane phospholipids, lipid metabolism, neurotransmission, and methylation. We can make small amounts of choline, um, but uh, just like we can make our own glucose, right? Carbs are non-essential for human life. We can make it from, from other substrates. It's probably not the uh, most efficient way of doing things, but choline intake is definitely associated with placental function, uh, neurodevelopment of the baby, and epigenetic programming in the baby. Paul, what's your take on choline? Hugely important. Almost exclusively found in animal foods. You'd have to eat pounds of broccoli a day to get choline. And who knows, who knows how bioavailable that choline is. But yeah, acetylcholine, phosphatidylcholine, super, super important. Found in egg yolks, liver, all the good stuff. Again, like yeah. liver, back to the organs, right there. There you go. And I mean, people want to take all these nootropics, nootropics, right? They want to take alpha GPC, which is choline. They want to take citicoline. It's like, just eat egg yolks, dude. Mm -hmm. Just eat liver. Like, yeah. just eat bioavailable choline from animal foods and stop with your silly nootropic supplements. Like, stop jamming alpha GPC into your body. Like, if you think that you need more choline for brain function, you're not eating enough liver and egg yolks and, um, and animal foods. I mean, meat, this is the key. I love this line of thinking so you can think, you can think about this so many different ways, right? You can think, all right, plant foods, spectrum of toxicity, they're defended. Okay. Animal foods, uh, not bad for humans, evolutionarily been prized. So animal foods are clearly important plant foods. Um, we can eat, uh, if we think about the spectrum of toxicity, but then there's this line of thinking around what are the unique nutrients found in animal foods that we cannot get anywhere else? How dis indispensable really are animal foods and they are so indispensable. There's so many nutrients like choline, there's carnitine, taurine, answerine, you know, like coenzyme Q10, you know, biotin, creatine, B12, K2. Like these are the freaking nutrients that make humans into badasses. Like these are the nutrients. These are the things people really want to supplement with K2, right? This is like the Rotterdam study clearly shows us that people who have more K2 in their diet, which is almost exclusively from freaking animal foods, nobody in Sweden, nobody in Denmark, which is where the Rotterdam study was done is eating natto. Um, and so they're getting K2 from animal foods and those with more K2, the highest tertiary had the lowest rates of cardiovascular disease. So these are super nutrients and they're found in animal foods. It just corroborates the case, but choline is another big one. All the good C's. Yeah. And it's interesting to hear about that with pregnant women. And it, like you said, I, it's really saddening to me um, that, that 
I would prefer that they eat, that they do a, a prenatal vitamin than nothing. And I would prefer that they do meat and organs, either fresh or desiccated than that. Yeah. Well, and the reason I really want to highlight this is because they changed the choline recommendation. So they said that pregnant women need a minimum of 450 milligrams of choline per day in pregnancy. But when you pull up these studies, and I've got a couple of them pulled up on my computer, when we look at the consumption of choline, there was actually better outcomes if, if these moms ate upwards of like 930 milligrams of choline. So more choline was better. It was better for their placentas. They had less babies with intrauterine growth restriction you know, big, healthy placentas, big, healthy babies. And so I just want to highlight the importance of choline in the diet. And if you're not eating nutrient dense animal foods like beef and organs and eggs and these types of things, you're not getting choline. And then the other things that ha the other thing that happens with choline depletion in pregnancy is, uh, you know, I only see this because I'm an obstetrician and gynecologist, but these women will breastfeed and breastfeeding requirements of choline are more than pregnancy. So if they're not eating in pregnancy, now they're breastfeeding. Now they're depleting their choline, depleting their choline, depleting their choline. Who's ever heard of mommy brain? Literally, I experienced it. My pregnancies were 23 months apart, which is probably not enough time to replete your nutrients, especially if you're breastfeeding and you deplete your choline and your brain, you literally just have this constant brain fog. You like can't function. I have seen women with depression and I mean, they literally can't think because of this choline depletion. So it's so important. I just think this is such an under talked about thing for, for women that are preconception in pregnancy, postnatally when they're breastfeeding, these nutrients just get depleted so fast. And I get so worried when people come in and tell me they're on a plant-based diet, or I don't eat a lot of red meat or no, I don't tolerate eggs. I'm like, Oh gosh, this is going to be an uphill battle. So I just really want to highlight the importance of these things. I love it. And how sad that mommy brain is kind of trivialized. Oh, I'm just a mom. Yeah. We just blow it off. Like it's a normal part of society. Like, off. Oh, it's just like, yeah, it's okay to be tired and run down. And like, it's, it's not, it's, <laughs> it's not. So, well, Paul, thank you so much for coming on here and giving us all your knowledge and expertise and God, we could have seven more podcasts talking about all these different topics. So tell people where they can find you, where they can find heart and soil. If the best place is probably at, <clears throat> yeah, the best place is probably at heartandsoil.co. We put a bunch of resources up there. We've got blogs about animal-based diets, carnivore-ish, carnivore diet. And then you can always email us at radicalhealth at heartandsoil.co if you have questions about carnivore-ish diets, any of this, or animal-based diets or carnivore, and we'll walk you through it. And obviously you can find desiccated organ supplements there if that's something you're interested in. I'm on all the socials at carnivoremd or at carnivoremd2.0 because Instagram deleted me. You, <laughs> they canceled you. They canceled me. Because you were talking about Schmovid. I know. I was talking about, uh, you know, it's just so ironic that, you know, you look back and you're like, the things I was saying are, are clearly true. Like you couldn't, you couldn't go to court and, and indict me for saying anything untrue. Um, it's just that Instagram wasn't hosting those questions. It's just and, crazy. It's yeah. crazy. I can't believe the world we're living in someday. So wild. All right. Well, keep kicking butt out there, Paul. Thanks for coming on. Thank you guys for listening to the Fit and Fabulous podcast. Stay tuned for uh, future episodes. We appreciate you all.